Hey friends, welcome back to She's At It Again. Today we're gonna to be making kind of a funky pie, and if you've ever had a pecan pie, this is real similar to that. In fact, you could actually use pecans in this if you wanted to, but this is a walnut pie made with honey and coconut sugar, so there's no traditional uh, bleached sugar in this, so nothing processed as far as the sugar goes. I think you'll enjoy this, but um, we're gonna make our crust first, let it chill for a while in the refrigerator, then make up our filling and get it to bacon. So let's go in the kitchen as we make a honey sweetened walnut pie. All right, so we're ready to start putting our ingredients in a bowl. Don't let this bowl trick you. It's not gonna fill up this bowl to make a pastry. <laughs> That's all we're gonna do right now is make a single pie pastry crust. So it's not gonna be this big, but you know what? I don't want to start with a little bitty bowl and have my ingredients flying all over the place because I'm needing to stir it because you're not only going to need room for your ingredients, you're going to need room for your motions. So the verb part of it, you're going to be moving around. You need room for that. So we're going to start with a level cup of unbleached, of course. Uh, mine is organic, but all purpose plain flour, nothing else in it. We're going to need a half a teaspoon of salt. And I'm just using a dinner fork to stir this around with. And that's really the thing that I found is the easiest to stir your ingredients with once you get your fat and your liquid in there as well. Now we'll get our butter out of the freezer. And not only do we get our butter, we get our cheese grater as well. This is very, very cold because what I thought I was gonna do three days ago, I'm just now doing. <laughs> I'm making a different pie. I had a, I had in mind to make some a little cherry tarts, but uh, I was feeling under the weather the other day, so this has been in the freezer for a bit. This is uh, six tablespoons of unsalted butter. And if your hands have a tendency to be warm, just leave the wrapper on it, peel it back and work with it that way. We're gonna grate this directly into the flour. Trying to work as quickly as we can, but at the same time, being careful not to get big giant chunks in there. We just want to grate it small. So all we have to do is basically stir it up. Now if you have a box grater, those work fine too. This one just happens to work a little better for me when I'm trying to get you as the viewer to see what I'm doing too. I am pretty much right-handed all the time, but every once in a while when I have a box grater in my hand, I don't know what hand to use to help the camera see it better because I know as someone watching it on a device, you're probably going, I can't see anything. What are you doing? <laughs> so I'm trying to help you out, but this flat grater just works a little better in that process. I try to put myself in your position watching it because I watch videos too, and I'm thinking, how, how do they expect us to know what's going on? I can't see it. Or I catch myself tilting my phone or turning my iPad around so I can see what they're doing which doesn't do any good. Now if you want to stop about halfway through this and kind of toss the flour around, the idea is to just coat each one of those little blobs of flour, or I'm sorry, little blobs of butter. I actually caught myself that time. I normally just go on like I think I've said the right thing. And my 
editor husband says, do you know what you're saying? I'm like, nope, I can tell you that ahead of time because I'm doing and I'm not thinking about what I'm saying. So I apologize a whole lot for that. So again, just know I'm really concentrating on what I'm doing. The butter will have a tendency to stick to the grater, really no matter what kind you use. So just be prepared to wreck it off with the fork or something that's kind of cold. If you wreck it off with your hands, it'll just stick to your hands, but you can always wipe it off your hands into the flour. going to take this and toss it like I said to coat each one of those little shreds of butter in there which at this point still looks like shredded cheese because it's still really cold any rogue ones that jump out of the bowl. All right, next thing we're gonna need is our really cold water and our sour cream. All right, normally I would take my cold water, pour it in, and put my tablespoon of sour cream on the top. But the last time I did a pie crust, I figured out that something that works better is If I take and add the sour cream directly to the water and then put it in there, if I just give it a little stir, that actually seemed to work better. So this is my tiny little cup. I have three tablespoons of water in this. this these are pretty handy. If you ever see one of these in a the store, just grab it. If you're a baker, there's so many things that that comes in handy for. So I'll hold it over the bowl because I know it'll probably slosh out just a bit. And we're working a little bit quick just because we want the butter to stay super cold. Now ideally, your bowl will be cold, your butter will be cold, your sour cream and your water be super cold, and you all mix it together. All right, then we're just gonna stir this just to get it where it's moist all the way through, but not over stir it, we're not kneading it, we're not manipulating it in any way other than just making sure that flour absorbs the moisture. And we want the butter to kind of stay in those little pea-sized pieces, if you will, or basically they're shredded cheese sizes right now, not peas. And you're gonna look at this and go, that's not enough water, I've done something wrong. It's not wrong. I've made pie crusts for a long time. Now, I can't speak like an 80-year-old person that says, I've been doing this since I was five. No, I probably made my first pie crust when I was, let's see, probably in the eighth or ninth grade. But my pie crust turned out so good and nobody else in my home ec class could figure out how I did it. I myself couldn't figure out how I did it, but I just acted like, oh, well, I guess that's how it's supposed to work. But at the time, I honestly probably thought, I guess our family just knows how to do that because my Nana was a great cook. She knew how to make a pie crust, although she didn't like making pie crust. She just liked buying them. But my ma, my mother's, my dad's mother, she could make a pie crust like nobody's business and she liked doing it. So I just kind of thought it was one of those things that I was supposed to know how to do. So I wasn't too surprised by it. 
So therefore my gratitude wasn't quite as, as profound as what it probably should have been. I should have been going, really? Holy cow, I did that. Mm. But at the time I just thought, oh well, I guess that's something I'm supposed to know how to do. But mine turned out really great. And I've just had the confidence to do it ever since. It's not that I'm doing anything special. Uh, I follow directions. I'm very detail oriented, so I try to get it right. Now, when you're mixing this up like this, when you get to where, well, to this part right now where I'm starting to gather it up together with my hands like this, and I'm basically pushing it into one single mass. If you get to a certain point and go, no, for sure this does not have enough water, you can always add, you know, a half a teaspoon more of water until it gets to the texture you think it's supposed to be. But trust me when I say, if you've used the right measurements on that, three tablespoons of really cold water and one tablespoon of the sour cream, it's gonna come together in the right amount. And that also includes the fact you've measured your flour properly. But you can always add more, you just can't add less. So just go slowly if you start adding more flour to it, or sorry, more water to it. So I'm not kneading this, I'm simply pushing everything together into a ball. See if I can turn this where you can see what I'm doing. You don't want it to be wet. This is not like a biscuit dough. You don't want it to be like um, a bread dough that's a yeast dough because that has enough moisture in it where my description for it has always been it should feel like really soft, smooth baby skin, but this will not really feel like baby skin. It's, it's not gonna feel, you're not really gonna notice that moisture as much. And I may be over complicating this for you. You may just mix it up and go, there, it was fine. I don't know what the, I don't know what the big deal is. I just don't want people to be intimidated by a pastry crust. It's really not that hard, or it's really not that difficult to master it. Because once you figure it out, the ratios of things, and you just, it's almost like you could do this with your eyes closed easier because you can just feel the moisture happening in your hands where you didn't really think you would. Then you go, oh, okay, now I, okay, yeah, I, I get it now. I get what it's supposed to feel like. And I think that's, really a lot of the issue that are holding people back in doing so many challenging things in cooking is they just don't know what it's supposed to feel like or what it's supposed to look like. When they if this is your first time of making a pie crust, don't be afraid. Once you master it, there's so many things to make once you get the pastry down. And I started out making pastries with bleached flour and Crisco and salt and water. And that was about the most tasteless thing ever. But whenever I took a pie somewhere, people would just go nuts over it. But really nobody knew, well, I didn't know of anybody that made any with butter and sour cream. Heavens, that was, that was fancy. Why would you use butter in a thing like that? Butter's so expensive but it makes all the difference in the world. Number one, butter is real food and shortening is not. And shortening is not good for you. And butter has value to it. So why make something with no value when you can have value and it's gonna taste so many times better. So when people eat something on a pastry at my house now, I think they probably comment that they enjoy the pastry as much, if not um, being surprised more about the pastry than about the filling itself. All right, we're gonna go directly into rolling this out.
Now, we're not going to be baking it right off the bat, but uh, I'm going to have to chill this for a little while, so we want to go ahead and roll this out. I'm going to take and lightly sprinkle some flour on this pie dish. Now, this is not a deep dish pie. This is just a regular pie dish like this, just a Pyrex dish. You can always rake up your excess flour and use it again if you want to. So don't be afraid to dust your countertop liberally. We're going to flatten this out just a little bit since it feels like Play-Doh right now. That's the consistency of Play-Doh. That's how it should feel. Now the warmth from my hand is um, of course going to warm that up a bit. So we'll work quickly. Let's see, I will use my wooden rolling pin on this. Sprinkle more on the top. I can see the little pink flecks of my pink Himalayan salt in there. And that's a good sign, it just means it's distributed well. Now periodically, if you'll take your hands and kind of round off the edges of this dough, and what I mean by that is there'll be little pieces like this in there, or little, part, little um, areas on the edge of it, you just want to round it out with your hands, pushing down with one hand in the center and then pushing in from the edge. It's just going to keep making it round regardless of what the crust wants to do or what the dough wants to do. You still want to keep it in a round shape. Now, when I was a kid, I paid very close attention to those cartoons, and I know for a fact you're just supposed to roll back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it's automatically going to come into a circle. And that is not what happened when we started making pastry. It um, doesn't work like that. You have to keep turning it over. You have to keep turning it around. You have to keep moving and working it, but at the same time, keep those edges in the round shape as best you can. And eventually, once it starts kind of staying in that round shape for you and being more compliant, you can start rolling it from the center outward. And always make sure you can move it freely on the countertop. You don't want it sticking anywhere because you might have a pretty round circle but you can't get it up off the countertop that's not going to do you any good you only want this slightly larger than the diameter of your pie pan that you're using but you still want to keep in mind you have the bottom surface then you have the edges to account for and then it has to go over the edge of the top just a little bit. You can always cut off any extra, any excess, but myself personally I don't cut it off. I fold it under. I use it somewhere in that pie crust because I use the ingredients for that and um, I'm going to use them somewhere. Even if I have to make designs and put on the top of it after it's already baked. We've made flowers and leaves and all kinds of fun things to put on the top. I even made letters that said happy birthday one time and baked and put on top of a cheesecake because I had all this excess dough left for the crust. And I thought, I'm not throwing that away. So, and it was somebody's birthday. So, it's the first time I'd ever made a cheesecake, which is kind of funny. I look back at it now and thought, man, I thought I was doing something so fancy. Oh. And it turned out good. All right, make sure it's not sticking. And that seems like it wants to stick to the countertop. Yep, it's tricking me over there.
All right, everything else is done. All right, there's two ways that I consider to be the easiest way to transport these onto a pie pan. One is to take and help this over your rolling pins like this. And then you're gonna transfer it onto your pie like this, lay it on there and then unroll it across. But the other way is the way I normally do it. So I'll show you that one as well. And this is just to fold it in quarters. Put that center point right there in the center of your pan. Unfold it, make sure you grab as many sides as you need. And then unfold it this way. And if it starts cracking right there, don't panic about that. Just, just don't panic. Make sure you get it well seated down into your dish. And now we start working on the edge. And what kind of looks like a shaggy mess actually starts coming up looking pretty nicely real soon. All right, we're gonna take and turn this under just a tad, pushing together any pieces that may have come apart. Spin your dish around as you're working. I find it easier to work on the far side of the pie than I do the one closest to me. Tucking it under as we go around. And if it seems kind of thick, just push it down to kind of even it out. Gather up all these pieces of pieces of pie dough that may have just kind of stuck to the counter or fallen off in transit into the dish. All right, just making sure it isn't so thick on one part of it, more so than the others. Now the next step is completely up to you, however you want to do this. I tend to do the same design over and over and over again just because it works for me. It's fast. It, I think it looks great, and it doesn't affect the taste whatsoever. All right, let me grab my bench scraper and get that flour out of the way. You know why it's called a bench scraper now. All right, this is what our pie looks like from the side. I'm gonna take my finger, this finger will be resting, let's see if I can turn this down a bit so you can see it. This finger I always use to push out, and this finger I'm gonna grab it, kinda of twist it like this, and then go like this, but it forms what kinda of looks like uh, a wave. I can't even remember what they call this just a traditional scalloped pie crust, maybe? I don't know. I clearly am not concerned about the fancy name for it, but some people take uh, the backside of a, of a fork and will press down and use that for the edge. Those are those edges tend to work well on things that you need a really thin crust on because it, ma it presses it down right next to the pie dish so it becomes really thin on the edge. Now some of this pastry right here seems a little moist. Use some of your flour. I got some over here that I just raked, raked up with that bench scraper. And put it in between your fingers. And transfer it over here so it won't be so moist on the edge. Also, when you're doing that, I normally go around this at least twice, making this little pinch rope looking thing. But at the same time, you wanna kinda of go along with your thumb on the outside edge right here, holding these fingers on the outside of the dish 
this thumb on the inside and you're going to kind of gauge the thickness of it all the way around so you don't want really thick spots and then thin spots somewhere else. You want it pretty much a consistent thickness all the way around. Okay, if this were a pie crust that we were just going to put in a hot oven and bake it really fast and then put a filling in it later on that doesn't get to bake, that's one thing. But this walnut pie is going to be baked in the oven, so we will not put holes in the bottom for air vents because it doesn't need that. It's going to bake with a filling in it. If we put holes in it and then put a filling in it, the filling's just going to run through and get on the bottom of our pan. Not what we want. We're going to put this directly into the refrigerator now. We're going to chill it a while and we'll come back. We'll make our filling for this and then bake it off. But for right now, this is what our pie crust looks like. I think we did a good job, guys. All right, we'll be back in just a few minutes. All right, we're back over here at the stove top now. We're going to make the filling for our pie. Pie crust is still in the fridge. It's staying chilled until we absolutely need it. I have my oven preheated already to 350. And we are going to be heating up some honey in this. I just have a cup of regular honey. I'm going to pour it in this small, small, small saucepan and add some butter to it. Just going to heat it up slowly. We don't need it super hot because we have eggs in this mixture and we don't want the eggs cooked by the hot honey. I have five tablespoons of butter and we're going to add this to the honey and when the butter is melted or at least softened then we can add it to our other mixture. All right, so just regular butter. All right, in this, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which camera to go with. In this bowl I have three whole eggs and we're going to beat these well. Also have a fourth of a cup of coconut sugar. Just gonna put that in there with the eggs. This is what the coconut sugar looks like. They have big bags of it at the store now. It's a lot easier to find than it used to be, so I'm excited about that because this has a really good, good flavor to it. Low glycemic index, but it tastes a lot closer to regular sugar than say honey does. Even though honey's a great sweetener, it does have that distinct honey taste to it that some people are just put off by, but this is a really good mild flavored sugar. We're gonna need vanilla in this as well. And this is just my homemade vanilla I've stashed in a different jar. I'm just gonna put about, uh, this calls for a teaspoon, so. We'll try to eyeball a teaspoon or more. If you're one of those people that put things on the burner and you forget you've put it on our burner and or you go to do something at the sink and you forget something's over in, in, in the works on the other side of the kitchen. Sometimes I will, <laughs> if it's like this, and I'm wanting the butter to melt in the honey, I'll put the spatula in it like this, and as soon as the honey gets warmed up enough to where the butter is softened a bit, the spatula will do this. And when I hear that on the other side of the kitchen, I know that it's ready to deserve my attention at that point because I am horrible about walking off. I will, I will come in from the outside. Sometimes I'll take the dogs outside for just to let them run around the backyard for a minute and I'll come back in and if I have the least little bit of a smell of whether it's something baking or uh, kind of a smoke smell or just something that's not right, I panic because I think what did I leave turned on? So luckily it's never been anything that's been de too detrimental and I know you probably realize if you've watched our channel long enough, I mentioned that we had a house fire almost 20 years ago. This particular house right here, and it was totally destroyed. The entire thing was destroyed except for the structure itself. But it was 
nothing to do with me. I'd, I'd already left the house. I was, at, I was on the other side of the state by that time. That was pretty devastating. <laughs> but my first thought when my husband called me and said, our house burned, I was like, oh, what did I do? Because I, I knew I had left the dishwasher running as I left the house, but it had nothing to do with that. All right, we also need about three tablespoons of flour in this. And I'm gonna add just a tiny bit of salt too. Probably, oh, less than a fourth of a teaspoon. I'm an eyeball measure like this. This is about three tablespoons because this is a fourth of a cup right here. <laughs> We're just gonna stir this in just to get it mixed well. Go ahead and get our pie crust out of the refrigerator at this point. And I'm going to be setting this on a shiny baking sheet because I don't want it cooking over and going in my oven. Now remember, we're not trying to get this hot. We're especially not trying to boil it. We just want to get it warm enough to where the butter is softened and then eventually melted. Because if you put a hot mixture like this into that egg mixture, you're going to have some scrambled egg pieces. And we want this to be as smooth as possible. I'm going to turn that burner off now. So have between a cup and a quarter and a cup and a half of walnut pieces. And I just looked through them and made, there were, made sure there were no shells attached to them. There was one. It had a piece on there I wouldn't have wanted to eat. All right, we're going to put this directly in this mixture. Give that a stir. our pie shell. All right, I do want to share with you kind of a hack. I don't want to put that directly on that burner. All right, so here's our pie. We're going to cook this for between 45 and 50 minutes, but what I want to show you is kind of a hack for making a baking shield. Now you've seen them in stores, they come in little pieces and it looks like a little collar that fits on the edge of this and what it's for is because you don't want your crust exposed 
over browning when you cook this for that long because 15 minutes in an oven at 350 degrees is going to get it pretty brown. So they want you to shield this. So here's our way of making one. So I've taken, this is just a standard piece of aluminum foil. I think this might be heavy duty foil. You'd be better off doing heavy duty. Just get a big square of it. You're going to cut an X right in the center of it. See, I've done this. You're going to cut an X in it. Only a big enough X that's about the size of the inside of your pie pan. Just peel these little ones back like this, bend them back, and then you're going to place this right over your pie, and don't squish it down on your pie crust. Just gently turn the edges under, and you can even attach it to the pan that you have it sitting on if you can do that. This one may be a little bit too big for that one. So what this is going to do is prevent that crust from over browning. We'll cook it with 25 minutes on and then we'll take it off and cook it for 20 to 25 minutes more. So we'll put this in the oven now. Hopefully it will not spill. Got to be level handed to do it. We'll set that for 25 minutes. We'll let that bake, then we'll turn, uh, we'll not, not turn, <laughs> leave the oven on 350, and then we'll come back and uh, take that off after 25 minutes of baking this first time, set the timer for another 20 minutes, and then finish baking off that, and then we'll get a look at our pie at the end. So we'll be back in just a minute. All right, our timer's fixing to go off. And I just want to show you how easy it is to take the foil off of this if you don't crimp it hard around the edge of your pie. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and reset this for another 25 minutes just because that's what it'll need after we take this off. Look, I'm just going to grab that foil. And foil by itself is not hot when you take it out of the oven. But that's what our pie looks for right now. And it's smelling good. All right, 25 more minutes should do the trick. Hopefully, <laughs> who knows? Doing the countdown here. Let's take a look at it. Ooh, it's looking good. All right, I'm gonna turn that off. So you can see it, but I'm, I'm going to stick it back in the oven. I'm always just a little leery when things don't look like they're set up. I'd rather cook it a little more than it's supposed to be cooked rather than it still be runny when I get ready to serve it. So I just wanted you to, get to be able to give you a good look at that. But I'm going to stick that back in the oven. And I don't know how long I'll stick it back in the oven before, but it's going to be done when I take it out. So. Anyway, it'll take more than, say, 50 minutes to cook this, so just know ahead of time. You're gonna need a little more time than that. I read in the comments on a lot of these recipes for pies that replaced the sugar and the corn syrup and all this stuff, because basically what we're doing is we're, number one, getting rid of the corn syrup, because if you don't know by now that corn syrup it's not very healthy for you. What it does is, let me try to explain it in the best terms that I've understood it to do, is what corn syrup does is unlike sugar, when you eat sugar or honey or something like that, it's like having a lot of different little faucets with a lot of different little drains and everything just goes through the plumbing of your body just smoothly like it's supposed to. When you have corn syrup, it goes directly into your liver, I believe it was. All of it, not part of it, but all of it. So it's like trying to push the ocean through this small tube and it's just not meant to do that. Corn syrup is too processed. It's too um, toxic because of the GMOs. <coughs> so we don't need to do that. Everybody's known for a while that 
you really shouldn't be eating corn syrup, anything with corn syrup in it. So we got rid of that, replaced it with the honey, but with the conventional sugar, the processed sugar being replaced with coconut sugar, this is just an all round good, good replacement for that. Now, if we could just get the cooking times down to where we know how much time it's gonna take, that would be great too. So I'll let you know by the end of this video how long it took me when I show you the final product. Okay, I just added 15 minutes to this and I actually moved it with my oven mitt on, kind of shook it a little bit to see if it was done and it's perfectly set. So let's take this thing out and we'll take a look at it. Okay, I didn't actually think it would firm up that quickly. Someone had said in the comments, I cooked it twice as long as what the recipe said and I was like, Pfft. Okay, we're not making this again if that's the case. But this is beautiful. I think I can hold this up here without it sliding off. That would be a <laughs> that would be a great blooper. Okay. I think you can see that pretty enough. The crust looks good, but that's a crust we use on everything. I'm not surprised at it. It always turns out good. But I think this is going to be nice, especially with that coconut sugar in it. I'm looking forward to trying this. This is the first time I've used this recipe for this pie, so it'll be interesting to see. Hey, thanks for joining us, and we hope you give this a try. The recipe is in the description, as always, and we look forward to sharing something again with you real soon. Bye, guys.